I have to confess I'm not a scientist, but I've been involved in communicating about technology for about 20 years. Um, I started my career at the Los Angeles Times in marketing and communications, but very quickly moved um, into uh, consumer electronics and worked for a firm that had over 300 patents that they systematically registered worldwide as part of their marketing strategy. Um, so I'm very familiar with the importance of patents to not only um, creating new and useful products, but also creating sustainable economic um, opportunities for everyone. I'm delighted to be here. Um, all of you are very, very impressive. And I think one of the things that um, continues to amaze me whenever I meet a scientist is, especially a female scientist actually, and I'd like to talk about that in a second, is how much value you place on doing good, um, as well as re retaining your passion for discovery. Um, that may be a uniquely um, female trait that um, we can bring to the world in, in, in our, the context of our professional lives. Uh, but I know there are many challenges, and I think this session is about how do you achieve high, high uh, rates of success in your professional career um, while trying to fight and beat down barriers um, of gender discrimination in a lot of different ways. So maybe we can start off by having a, a you know, the 30, you've heard about the 30 second elevator pitch? If you haven't, you need to, because some of you will be pitching ideas to venture capitalists and companies and funding agents, et cetera. So the 30 second elevator pitch is where you say in 30 seconds or less, um, your life story and your, your life passion. I'm gonna put that question right now, okay? So that everyone here can get an idea of briefly what you're interested in and um, how you got there in just 30 seconds. And then we'll do that around the back room as well for the University of Geneva students. I'm Zora Dwafli, a neuroscientist uh, from Tunisia. And uh, I'm working on uh, protein misfolding disease, especially Alzheimer's disease. So uh, during my work, I try, uh, now I try to, uh, oh, yes, <laughs> to find a drug uh, which can uh, treat Alzheimer's. Fantastic. Okay. Thank you so much. Great 30 seconds. All right. Hi, I'm Priscilla Kulibiamanti from Ghana. I'm also a neuroscientist. I am interested in finding other treatment options for resistant epilepsy. That's epilepsy that does not respond to the drugs that we currently have. And I do that by exploring the traditional knowledge that's available in Ghana. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Thank you for being here. I'm Karen Holberg from Argentina. I'm a physicist. Uh, I work in the south of Argentina, and I'm interested in the basic electronic properties of, of novel materials. Uh, we look at the quantum physics of these materials, and uh, we want to look at new properties that hopefully could have some application uh, at present or in the future. So, hello, my name is Minna al Sarafi or Minna Talla. Uh, I'm a postdoctoral fellow at Center for Genomics in Egypt, and I work on DNA repair mechanisms. So, we're trying to understand how certain repair mechanisms happen and what kind of genes are involved in th these mechanisms to be able to relate it to diseases later on. A junior group leader in the Josep Carrera Research Center in Barcelona. Um, basically, I'm completely passionate about how the DNA folded within the nucleus in the three-dimensional space, and we are using this information to try to contribute to new treatment for uh, pediatric acute uh, lymphoblastic leukemia. I'm Mika Nomoto from Japan. I'm, my field is a plant pathology to, to understand how plants induce immune response against pathogen or insect. So, yeah. uh, I am Nurjan Tunçba. Uh, I am from Turkey, and my field is bioinformatics. Uh, I develop computational models to understand what happens uh, within the cell uh, when uh, a disease happens, for example in cancer, how it changes from the normal state to uh, a cancer cell. I'm working on that. 
Hello, I'm Anna Paola Coppola from UNESCO. I'm not a scientist. <laughs> I'm the project officer for the L'Oreal UNESCO for Women in Science program. So I accompanied these wonderful ladies here. <laughs> We're going to do the same thing for our visiting students from the University of Geneva. Good morning, my name is Nirvana Caballero. I'm a physicist, I'm Argentinian, and I'm currently working at the University of Geneva as a postdoctoral researcher. And I'm interested in studying disorder systems. Disorder systems are glasses, ferroelectric, ferro ferromagnetic materials, or even cell fronts. And my work is to try to model these systems and to do simulations to try to understand how to control them better. Thank you very much. Hello, my name is Chen, Chen Wang. Uh, I'm a PhD student in computer science. Uh, so my project is um, I'm studying how our body, our facial expression, our gesture, our heart rate reveal our affective status. To be more specific, our emotions, our feelings towards others. So it's a combination of computer science and uh, psychology. Thank you. Hello, uh, my name is Beatrice Gallina. I'm a student at the University of Geneva and I study computational linguistics, in particular as it pertains to machine translation. Good morning everyone, my name is Amuda Ravishankar from India. Uh, my background is quite multidisciplinary. I was an urban planner first. So in 2004, Indian Ocean uh, tsunami, and 2009, the North Arabian, uh, North African uprising kind of changed my entire career because both of the times I was working in those places. So right now I'm working on uh, collective intelligence in crisis response, role of social media, artificial intelligence, and crowdsourcing in humanitarian responses. Thank you. Hello everyone, I'm Ege Akula, I'm from Turkey, I'm a physicist and I'm working at the Atlas Experiment at CERN. So currently I'm interested in understanding our universe better, so I'm looking for new particles and I'm also trying to develop new techniques to look in a more efficient way. Hello, good morning, I'm Rashede from Iran. Uh, I'm going to start my PhD uh, in studying the growth and shrinkage of the microtubules, uh, actually in the biophysics field. Thank you. Uh, hi, I'm Chloé Rouffer, I'm from France. I started my PhD one year ago and I'm working in biophysics. I'm looking at uh, cancer cells and how they answer to change of uh, pressure on uh, membrane tension on um, uh, change. <laughs> uh, and I, uh, I try to apply uh, actual uh, theoretical physics on real biological system and try to combine analysis with uh, lots of uh, huge data, huge set of data on uh, biological cells. Um, a very diverse range of expertise for sure in the room. Um, and rather than you know, ask particular questions about your individual fields, I thought we could start a discussion on the challenges of succeeding as a scientist. And in, also instead of beginning with the obvious issues of discrimination and other issues that we face as women, but particularly in the scientific field. I wanted to ask um, a question or focus on a question that was submitted by the um, students earlier on. How do you as researchers deal with the issue of doubt in the progress of your work? And do you feel that that doubt um, is imposed on you more because you are a woman? And what, what suggestions do you have for these young budding scientists in addressing that? One has to doubt. I mean, it's, it's, it's very, very important and we're constantly challenging ourselves and challenging the, the other scientists. Uh, however, there's a question of personality that I can understand because I read this question, I think it was very interesting. Who posted it? Um, you. I think it's, uh, it's, really, it's really interesting because it's a question of personality and I think this comes in a lot uh, in us as women in science, in the uh, social aspect of, of women in science. And many t this is something I was reflecting on that uh, we have all uh, reached uh, a, a position, we have this very relevant award that helps us to be more visible but there is an aspect that has to do also with another of the questions that has to do that with our attitude again. We have to really prove ourselves much more sometimes, and this should not be the case. We, we shouldn't have to 
uh, uh, challenge the system so much, and it has to do with the doubting. We, we, we don't have to re show ourselves as so self-assured constantly. It, it should be normal that we just walk through science with our doubts, with our personalities. We don't have to be heroines to, go, to, to be able to be successful in, in science. I put it in quotation marks, of course. Uh, it shouldn't be like that, but somehow the system, the social system, is asking us to show, to prove us that we are some more than what we are. So I think most of us, at least in my case, uh, we achieved uh, we achieved things because of our personalities, because we were we were able to fight our way through, and this has to change. Uh, I, I think that this uh, the psychological aspect and the interpersonal relations should should change. It should be a natural. Uh, environment to work uh, with our uh, defects, with our personalities. It, it should be able that, that that women with weaker personalities also uh, move through. I mean, we, we don't have to be all too strong to just uh, challenge and, and to to overcome the situation. So I don't want to be too long, but uh, we, uh, that has to change. Doubt is normal. And we have to just say, well, yes, I have, a, I have a doubt, I have a basic question, I don't understand that. This is science. If we don't allow ourselves to do this, then we're not doing science. The scientific method is failing. I also agree. So doubt is very healthy. So you're never sure that you have the right experiment done until you do another experiment that shows the same thing that you have done before. This is very healthy. It's normal. You, yeah, it's part of your life. If you start uh, like uh, being very confident about yourself, and also, like, this can get into being a bit arrogant, then you will not be a true scientist. <laughs> so, yeah, it's completely normal. <laughs> uh, I asked this question because when we got results, I felt that sometimes we present the result, and especially the close collaborators or the people in the lab, they, they doubt about the result because this is the job to doubt about what someone else is uh, showing. Uh, and sometimes it leads to lots of discussion on the fight, but nice fight. Um, but I felt that as a woman, sometimes they more assume that I was wrong than for male colleagues that had the same result. Mm -hmm. And it happens to me a lot to show something and to say, what mistake did you do? And it was the first question that I got. And in that case, I don't know if you felt that. So I don't know if it's real or not real, but I did observe that uh, there were not as many doubts on male colleagues for same amount of experiments, same way of presenting than for female presenting the same. Um, yeah, and I don't know how to address that because then it's coming hard on, on people. But it's more with the self-doubt. How do you handle the self-doubt as culturally imbibed the gender? How to deal with yourself? You need to, you need to learn. And it's something that's going to happen. You just need time. And also, it, time can help your problem. Because, you know, maybe you're, you said that you started one year ago. Maybe you need a little more of time to, that, that your colleagues will know you. We know that there is some unbiased, uh, uh, there is some unconscious bias, right? And that's it. <laughs> you, we cannot fix it. We are trying, but it's going to take a long time. So maybe you need time, and at some point you will position in the lab in, in one level in which they're not going to doubt your work because you're just a woman. Yeah, I mean, sometimes women are a bit uh, apologetic, like, or they show that oh, I'm not so sure. But don't try to show this, but rather say, like, to, to me, sure more, I will do this experiment as well. Not that I'm doubting my own results, I'm sorry, you know. So it, it depends on how you say it, how you talk to the people. Yeah. So just be careful in, in the... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah I, I completely agree. So um, we are different, and, and that's fine, and this is great, because, you know, diversity is the same as rich, to be rich, right? But... Um, yeah, sometimes you need to learn also how to perform. So, um, and if you feel like you are, and if people feel that you are not self-confident, and it's something related with a female property, try to pretend that you are self-confident. It's the message, how you communicate. It's also important. Sometimes you cannot be arrogant, but sometimes you have to say, hey, here I am, and I am good, I'm really very good. My project is super cool. If you say, if you, at least you try to pretend to think this, it's going to help. So try, try to do it. There is a bit of self-contradiction from the first thing that you said to the question to say, science is about doubt, and then also to say, as a woman, you have to be self-confident sometimes. And it's a balance between the two that I found really hard to, 
to manage. You don't have to show to people that you're doubting yourself. So if you, I'm doubting myself at home on my desk, but when I'm in a meeting, I don't tell people, hey, I'm so doubtful, you know. <laughs> you just have to make sure that your data is really accurate and, and satisfy yourself that you don't have any doubt before you publish. But this, this you don't have to show to everyone around you. You know, so this is between you and yourself, it's important. It's also important to doubt your collaborators, to doubt your, the, the other people, it's very important, because if you don't, and, and if their work is not very accurate, they can also put you in really bad situations. I've heard so many stories about people, like the paper gets retracted, everyone gets affected at the end. So you have to also doubt the collaborators and doubt yourself, but not, don't be open to share this in public. Yeah. What I wanted to say in a different way, um, it's good to doubt because then you make sure you are careful and um, a lot of the times the way we simply get around the doubt is to repeat the experiments. I mean if you repeat it and then you get the same results, it's hard to doubt. But I think um, your, your problem is coming from how you are reacting to the other people and what you're saying. Of course they will, they will criticize, are we okay? but it is what you allow to land. Listen to what they are saying, and then have an open mind. Pick what you need to take out of that criticism, and let's go of the rest. Are we okay? I think what you're, 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 you're struggling with is um, the self-critic, and you are feeding the doubt. Mm -hmm. So you are overthinking what they are saying. You don't need to overthink what they are saying. They, they pose questions, listen to their questions, critically analyze the questions, look out for what lessons you can pick out, and then let it go. Are we okay? And as much as possible, try to celebrate your little victories. Because like we've been saying, science is incremental. The results you get are little, little steps. So celebrate your little victories. Are we okay? and then take it one day at a time. You don't have to think of 10 years, what's going to happen in 10 years in advance. Are we okay? It's very important. You have to separate scientific doubt and personal doubt. And you can even be prepared and tell the person, oh, thank you very much for your criticism and everything, and then you answer. Not be completely astonished and paralyzed but you take and, and as you told, and ask also the other one, ah, I think it's a good idea, but I see this and that problem. You have to be prepared before you go, you enter in such a, in such a meeting. It's a fight. It's a very interesting discussion. Now, I, I, you're all a very young generation, and, and I have a, a specific question to, to, to you. Do you really believe today that what is known as positive discrimination is still needed. Uh, I have my serious doubts on it. Because I, at certain instance, I, I've been, you know, I've had a long career in different areas and I've never really felt any difference between men and women working together. I think sometimes it's in our heads, maybe it's my experience. Uh, I think sometimes, uh, you know, as our distinguished colleague from Argentina had said, you need to prove yourself that you're a woman. But I have to assure you that if you come from a developing country and you're working in Europe or the United States or some other culture, you have to prove yourself more. And I don't know whether this is really uh, something that we should really continue to look at and to draw a line that there is a difference between men and women because I personally do not see it. I think men and women are have the same uh, capabilities. I think they should have the same chances. And I don't know from your own experiences whether you really feel that there are problems just being simply a woman in advancing in your careers and, and being able to be scientists and, and, and to move on in life uh, to get to be, you still can be the president of the World Bank, by the way. You know, don't get it out of your, your calculations. You know, I come from, from a developing country Egypt, uh, I think women have their role in society. I have a sister who's younger than me, she's an ambassador, she works in the UN. So at a certain time, I think it depends a little bit on what you have inside you. So this doubt that you're talking about uh, should be scientific doubt, yes, when you work, and, and as you have indicated, that's the origin of being a scientist. 
But I never think that you should doubt who you are and what you're capable of. Because the moment that you start doubting, the person in front of you is going to start doubting you too. And all my life working, I've always worked, and maybe I'm lucky, uh, you know, either with bosses or with peers, or, and they were always sure of themselves, they knew what they wanted to do, they had a very clear uh, opinion about where they want to get to, and most of them have got to those uh, places. So I don't know whether from the beginning it's useful sometimes to think that you're starting from a disadvantageous position and whether this conditions you really to go forward in the future. But maybe your experiences would prove me wrong and maybe that you've had really difficulties to, to, to prove that. And maybe, yes, we still continue to need uh, what's called positive discrimination so that we can favor women, we can favor uh, people who you know, come from uh, developing countries, least developed countries and so on. But I would think that today, with everything that we live, the changes that we see in our world, I don't know whether it's really, really necessary, but, you know, I revert to you. Yes. Being, no, 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 I, I agree with you. I have no, no idea of be, women being victim. But the system is so that it is more difficult for women still now. At the University of Geneva, for instance, we have 62% of students and only 20% of full professors. So it has nothing to do with women. Women in science, they are excellent. It has to do with the system. So we need a little bit of uh, positive discrimination, discrimination still now. Mentoring programs and, and working also. I have done campaigns about stereotypes and making people aware of their stereotypes and gender bias. But of course we progressed a lot and we are still progressing. So the problem is not men or women, it's more, more the system. When people enter into science, men or women, they are good, they are good. But then some are less prepared to the struggle, to the power struggle, it's more this. And it is a, a, a question of personality, of course. Some women are very strong and they will get everything, of course. Yes, I, I completely agree. But thank you for bringing this in because I also struggle with this. Ideally, we're all human beings, okay? We're all part of this humanity. But uh, and there shouldn't be so... I, but I, there shouldn't be uh, this positive discrimination or positive actions. However... Uh, I think I think we still need to push a little bit further. We, we still need to help, and I, I don't I don't like it very much because I agree. We, we were talking about we were discussing about quotas. The are about qu uh, male quotas in science. I voted against the quotas. Uh, wh why? Because I felt completely identified with a, with a with a woman who said that if I get a position because I'm a woman, it's not good. So this this also makes makes us feel bad sometimes. Uh, however, there are small things that one can do uh, respecting those things. Like, for example, so many conferences that are really uh, uh, male-dominated in the sense that the whole panel or the invited speakers are mainly men. I'm in several committees. In Brazil, for example, there's a committee. We, were, we, we I missed the meeting yesterday. But last year I went, and, and the uh, invited speakers are 90% men in physics. And, and, there are no, and there are many more women out there, and because we, we do have, even we have a bias when we, when we think of, of, uh, of speakers. So these small things, this unconscious bias you were referring to, or for example, um, so for example, helping women to travel, uh, these travel grants for women, etc. So my main uh, concern is, uh, there's no obvious reason uh, that there shouldn't be a balance of women in science. I'm thinking about the hard sciences where we really have an imbalance, like physics, computer science, mathematics. There's, there's no reason why there shouldn't be a, a gender balance. And there is a very big gender balance. There's low, less than 30% women in these, and even very mu much less, as you said, in the, higher, uh, in the higher positions. So there is still a problem. And, uh, and I think it's basically a cultural problem and, and that has to change culturally there has to be a change in paradigm and women should be able to do science naturally not think twice about a career of or or, or 
or family, etc., etc. So I think these small things change, but they have to be taken, they have to be implemented with a lot of care and tact, because it shouldn't uh, affect us. It shouldn't. Uh, uh, come back to us in a negative way. It's not only in science. I know in science it might be a little bit even more complicated, but I'm just talking about society in general today, whether it is the banking sector, uh, whether it is any sector, universities. Uh, again, maybe, yes, the system is still a little bit shut down. Uh, true, maybe that still there's more selection of men than women, you know. But I think that we're living in an age where uh, this gender difference, uh, I, I personally do not see that we, I take it into consideration. You know, I, I, you know, I know that you, know, you have your own experiences and I, I'm very happy that we have a debate on this. You know. But I think there's one basic rule. Don't ever put yourself as a victim or in a weaker position, whoever you're dealing with. You know? And you know, I've, I've come from a developing country and I've never put myself in that position. Uh, it was tough at certain instances and might be tough to be a woman, but, you know, being a woman, as we were saying the other day, you know, uh, being pregnant doesn't stop you from doing what... Pregnancy is not an illness. And this is what you were saying the other day, and you're totally right, you know. And being a woman is not a disadvantage. As a young scientist, and uh, I was... I had lots of hope and I want to do lots of different things. I joined a, I joined a department, this is 15 PI. On 15 PI, there were only white, old, male. Only male. <laughs> All of them. It, 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 was, it was impressive. And then among the, among the PhD students, it's half-half. Among the postdocs, there were more men. The men that are here are with their wife and with their kids. The women that are here as postdocs are alone and they are doing uh, the, the transport every weekend to go back to their boyfriend. And they are looking for positions that are around their boyfriend because the boyfriend already has a permanent position, but it's not their case. So they don't even choose where they're going to live and they are postdocs. And me as a young person, I'm like, okay, where are the women? When, when do we disappear? And when I enter into a room of 60 males and I'm the only woman, I'm like, okay, I'm going to disappear soon, obviously. <laughs> No, 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 of course. No, no, so, and we don't want to, we don't want to, but statistically speaking, we know that it's happening. And then recently, because I did the only woman call to get a, a, a woman PI, so only woman, they got a woman, and I see this PI every day, and every day I'm happy to see her and to know that she's here. And I know that she has four kids, that she managed to do her life and that she's happy. I'm just one woman among 15 male makes me like really hopeful about what is happening. And without the only woman call, there would be no woman still. So, no, no it's, it's true and it's, it's strong, but uh, emotionally speaking, in order to continue to do what I love and what I want to do, I really need to have women as PI <laughs> somewhere. And, uh, I partly agree with you because I have a nine-year-old and when I'm bringing him up, I don't, uh, of course, he's a boy, but it's not that I'm not raising him with gender as a as a key thing in what he does or what he learns or how he wants to do. But what we see as discrimination, I'm taking it beyond science as you said, what we see here as discrimination is completely different from what we see back home or what I see in my family as a discrimination. And stopping it here is like ultimately affecting the tail end wherein they are just starting. So that's where that's where we have to have like a leverage or mileage because yes, we are trying to compete with one in 15 here, but I'm trying to prove like one in thousand there or one in more than just that. Not just to have an access to the, uh, or just to eat whenever they want. The level of discrimination, the level of patriarchy or how culturally, it's, it's not shown as discrimination. That's the beauty of it. It's like they've told, oh, you're a mother, you should sacrifice. Oh, it's like taking beyond just science or, yes, we are putting in an extra effort not to sound. You know, I don't believe all are equal. You know, all of us have our own pluses, our own mi uh, minuses. And I wouldn't play a gender card unless it's like really necessary. But at the same time, but why are we forcing ourselves not to play the gender card? Like, for example, in my previous office, uh, yes, we took a full-time uh, full job. A male colleague 
going at 3.30 to pick his son is seen like, oh, fantastic, you're doing a fantastic for the job. But me leaving to pick up my son at 4.30 every day and say like, oh, please have your meetings before that, it's seen as, ah, okay, that's why we don't have women in offices. That's where the difference lies. And it's a big difference. So we still see. And it's not just male or female anymore. Uh, uh, anymore. When we have to be gender inclusive, we need to accept people as they are. And that really goes a long way from where we are now. It's like, yes, we shouldn't be seeing who we select. We, uh, we shouldn't, of course, I do see like we are selecting consciously representations. I see it in several panels. I know uh, offices, they are like really taking extreme steps so that the panel is not manual anymore. And there is like cultural diversity. And we live in a city, fantastic city, wherein it gives that importance to cultural background differences, everything. That's nice. But slowly, the boundary should evade. And, but it, we, uh, as I said, the tail end has to catch up a lot. And yeah. if we stop here, we are stopping that tail end. I think that's what our uh, uh, yeah. focus should be in. Women are entering everywhere. When you see at the University of Geneva, we have a majority of students, majority of PhDs, and so So really, you can get the impression that they are everywhere. But really, the, the career is still difficult for all the reasons you said. So I think we should even maintain more, uh, do more support in order really to change to, to, and not to go back again to uh, more discrimination. Until there is equal representation throughout the entire hierarchy and system, we will not be able to encourage young people to follow science. Um, I want to just give you a short example. Do, does anybody follow, did anybody follow the solar eclipse in the United States a couple of years ago? Um, it was broadcast all over the world. I guess it was all over the world. Pardon me. <laughs> um, but interestingly, the, most of the broadcasting stations made an enormous effort to have women commenting. And it was tweeted about and plastered all over social media that for the first time you've got women meteorologists, women scientists talking about this major event around the world. Um, so the importance of continuing your fight, I think, to get equal representation should not be abandoned yet. And it takes policy, it does take policy intervention, both at the institutional level and at the government level, for example. Again, a personal story. When I gave birth to my children in the United States, I had six weeks off. Uh, six weeks, okay? That's still the case in the United States. You come to Europe and you get four months minimum in most countries. More often you get six months to a year, you know, at reduced pay. So uh, those of you who are working in science institutionally can advocate at the, at the policy level um, for these kind of changes. I'd like to add, uh, the topic you mentioned on coming from developing or underdeveloped countries, that's, that's also very important, and I felt it a lot. I felt that, top, that issue much more than my gender bias in my career. Because uh, you, you have publications, but then they're not looked at because you are from a university from the end of the world. I mean, most of us probably felt that. But, uh, and this is, this is something that is also there, discrimination from the, our origin. Uh, and we, we have to address that somehow. I just wanted to bring it in because it was, and, and uh, so minorities, or even in Argentina, they're not minorities. I mean, youth, that, have, that even boys and girls that don't have equal access to education, that's very, very important. I think even uh, more important than the gender biases in Argentina in, in science and in education. In education, uh, the equal access to, to basic education is uh, much more important than the gender bias. And then, of course, what? But I'm getting out of the topic, but I just wanted to, to remind this. Okay, so actually, so in the developing countries, especially if I talk about Egypt, maybe we come from a very privileged uh, area where we had uh, equal rights and nobody ever told you, like, there is a difference between a girl and a boy. But there are some areas where girls are not allowed to get educated, like their uh, brothers. And um, yeah, also this marriage pressure, it's uh, horrible in many societies. When I wanted to go, uh, to go to, for my master's in Germany, like even my aunts, they said like, but you're not going to get married soon, you know that? <laughs> you should wait till you find the right partner and then go whatever you want. So there was this pressure, but because I, I was strong enough not to fall for it, 
then I didn't listen. So this is also part of the society. And then when are you going to have kids? When uh, one kid, no, <laughs> he should have the second one. He will be lonely. <laughs> so <laughs> this is one thing. <laughs> so I, I was privileged not to have really something against me. But I also, like, um, I saw people from HR, for example, saying, like, ah, this girl just got married. Please don't hire her because she will soon have maternity leave. And uh, also, like, some guys telling me, yeah, but, you know, your job is not so serious. Anyway, it's the financial responsibility. The, the financial stuff is the responsibility of the man more in the Middle East. And it's just a hobby for you. I'm like, no, it's not a hobby, you know. So we have still this social, maybe, uh, yeah, problems. And we, ha we have to just be strong and face it. In all cases, you know, we are uh, gender biased in the academy, you know. So we do give more importance when we have the choice to select women than men and we'll continue to do it uh, but I think it's a very interesting point and and obviously from a lot of things that you're saying there are more social uh, factors uh, cultural factors that stop women more than the work environment the capability the capacity and so on and maybe this is what you call the system so part of the system is the perception that unfortunately men continue to have when they look at their sisters and when they look at their daughters and the place that they have to uh, uh, assume in society. Obviously, one of the things that also have to change is that, and this is something we shouldn't forget, and, and in our culture, I think we realize it more and more, that socialization of children is done by mothers. Mm -hmm. and, and that's why, yes, in a lot of cultures, yes, maybe not in Spain, but I can assure you in... Yeah, in, my husband in, is taking care of the kids right now. No, but, well, that's very good. Yeah. But, you know, in a, lot of, in a lot of cultures, whether we look at India, whether we look at Egypt, you know, it is the mother that tells the child, uh, the boy and the girl, what they can and what they can't do, mm -hmm. and what's expected from them, and where they're supposed to proceed in life in the future. And this is something where I think is also extremely important that at a certain time, mothers look at their boys and girls equal yeah. and they know that their chances in life should be exactly the same whether they want to 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 get married and have dozens of kids mm -hmm. or they want to pursue a career and so on mm -hmm. so yes you know at the end of the day there are social factors as you have rightly indicated that certain instances do impede the advancement of women mm -hmm. yes it's interesting also men should share more the part of education because for instance my, my, my father opened the door to me so it's very important to have also a present father and only, not only a mother being, uh, being uh, doing all the job so you have also to share this mm. I think we've talked a lot about career management and before I switch to the other issue I just want to share for those of you who have any self doubt you should watch a TEDx from a young um, Harvard professor named Amy Cutter, okay? And Amy Cutter has done research on the amount of testosterone <laughs> <laughs> that a woman can generate by expanding her physical size before, before you know, a, a, a cripplingly nervous-making meeting. So go watch Amy Cutter, and then before you meet and present your lab, results. Um, <laughs> stand in the bathroom and expand your physical size. <laughs> okay, so the last issue I thought we could cover briefly, because I think it's an important issue, is, um, is industry versus ac academia as career paths. And what, I didn't see a lot of people here coming from industry, but maybe you can share some of your thoughts, processes, how you made the decision to stay in academia, um, partnerships, collaborations with industry that may help your career in academia, I throw it open to you. There are not so many possibilities in Argentina of continuing in industry. I mean, that's, that, that's a basic fact in our developing countries that we do not have an, a, a high-tech industrial development and, and this has to come. So th this is why so many of us, uh, physicists, scientists, they stay in, in academia, which should change. Okay, so for me, staying in academia was pretty easy because I actually tried my hands at a lot of things. I, my bachelor's is in pharmacy, so I'm a registered pharmacist. So I tried clinical pharmacy, I tried community pharmacy, I tried industrial. But um, none of them was as interesting as ac academia for me. 
And for me, because I'm into drug development, um, I didn't really see the need to stay in the industry because I could still work on my drug development and still collaborate with people in industry. So I still have a link with industry, but I prefer the research. And, and just like she said, we are a developing country. A lot of the pharmaceutical companies do not have um, capacity in terms of research. So it's better if you stay in the public university. Yeah. So actually, okay, we, we don't have R&D in, <laughs> in our countries as well. But uh, the thing is that this uh, academia package is very interesting because you interact with students, you supervise, you teach, you write grants, you have always um, milestones you want to pass. So this package is very fulfilling also. And also that you can follow your curiosity. If you find any observation on the side, you can always go and follow it. If you're in the industry, you're really, like, you have a tight, like, <laughs> you're not allowed to look at something else besides the goal that you have to submit very soon. So th this kind of flexibility and satisfaction, I think, is very unique for this career. Stressful, but unique. <laughs> yeah. So I really love academia, and I'm a, I'm, I'm a scene in academia, but uh, we also have to think that there is also a problem with academia. So... Um, you know, so a security job is not so easy to get a permanent position. Economically speaking, it's not really very well paid, as it is in, 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 in the academia. So also it depends what's, what, is, what are your priorities. So if you want to have a nice job with a nice, uh, you know, a salary uh, to have a permanent position, um, maybe at that point uh, it, it, the, the biotech company is going to be better for you. So you, you need to learn how you are, right? And depending on what do you want, uh, just choose. So it's not that one is good, one is wrong, right? It's just, it's, it's, it's just for you. Other nice thing is I think uh, every day you uh, start with a new idea maybe or uh, with a different stuff. Uh, time to time uh, the week starts with a nice uh, discovery maybe or uh, the, other thing, uh, the other week you have uh, so many fails. This is the, <laughs> the, I think the motivating and nice part. I, I, I think last week we, uh, somebody has mentioned that you have, you don't have uh, a boss. Uh, this is another, <laughs> uh, another nice thing I think in academia. Yeah. I'm not sure if I can. I, I was in a professional for like ten years and then I moved into academia after a long time. So, but uh, the only thing is like I would really wish there is like a. a a culmination point for academia and the industry. Uh, the one we are working on, uh, we have a program called GTI, part of the University of Geneva, my boss, uh, Francois Gray. He is uh, encouraging students to be uh, come up with their own startups or entrepreneurial skills, and he's providing the resources that is like extremely available in uh, the in, uh, uh, International Geneva. And then they focus on what is the most important challenges, like SDGs. We, our core focus is SDGs. So that way, the academia is constantly in touch with the, uh, uh, the uh, industry as well, because we are uh, taking up what the challenges the industry is providing and what the academic solution uh, could be for that. So uh, because we have a like, lot more girls than boys in, in, our, uh, in, the, in the master's program. So that has to be like a constant effort, even from the academia, to have the link with the industry, because you can't separate both. Students have to end up going to projects at the same time. The industry should also be in touch with the new researchers that is coming up. So I think we should stop uh, differentiating separately anymore. Maybe.